This video is a short introduction to the various topics that we can vote on. Uh, if you want more information about any of these, you can always talk to me or look at the readings uh, or maybe uh, Google to find some stuff. So I'm just going to go through each of the topics and give a quick introduction to what we'll be studying if we vote for these topics. So the first, AI consciousness, artificial intelligence consciousness. So this is the question of whether a computer or whether a robot could ever sort of be conscious, could ever have a mind. So we build robots or we build computers that seem to talk to us and seem to understand things and seem to do stuff. But you might think, oh, they're, they don't actually like have anything going on in their heads. They don't actually understand what they're doing. They're just carrying out orders. They're not like human beings. They're not even like animals. Uh, they don't sort of have a conscious experience. They're just robots. And so the question is, is that true or no? Could we build artificial intelligence that is fully conscious? Next topic is ancient Greek philosophy. We would read Plato, uh, four of his dialogues. So the Euthyphro is a dialogue about uh, sort of uh, justice and uh, piety and doing what the gods want you to do. And the question is, uh, is something pious because the gods want you to do it? Or do the gods want you to do it because it's pious? And it turns out to be kind of confusing which of those two makes sense, what those two mean. Uh, and so there's a dialogue about uh, what we should possibly say about piety. And by extension, uh, what is good, what is just, because the gods are uh, expected to want us to do good things. The Apology is uh, a dialogue in which Socrates, the famous Athenian philosopher, has, is sort of defending himself against people who are uh, tr trying to put him to death, basically trying to expel him from the city or otherwise punish him for corrupting the youth. And so uh, it's a dialogue about sort of what Socrates thought about philosophy and what the purpose of philosophy is and uh, what we should tolerate in our cities. The Crito is after he lost the trial and he's in jail waiting execution and one of his friends comes to him and says, look, Socrates, we can get you out of jail. Uh, we can bribe the guards and get you on a ship and you can sail off and live. And Socrates is saying, no, I'm not going to do that. Why? And then they have a discussion about why you should follow the law and what reason uh, there is to follow the law and where that comes from. And then the symposium is, uh, it's a sort of a bunch of people, it's a dialogue in which a bunch of people are uh, together and they're drinking and there's entertainment and stuff. And then they all sort of tell stories and the stories they tell are like philosophical uh, explanations of various topics. And uh, mostly it's about things like uh, truth and beauty and love and how these things relate. Ostensibly, they're all about love. Um, and so uh, it covers a wide amount of ground. It's a really interesting dialogue. The next topic is can art lie? And so the puzzle here is, uh, let's say you watch a movie or read a book, and the question is, could that ever deceive you? Could it ever uh, try to deceive you? And one answer you might have is no, because art only sort of, the only thing art expresses is whatever you take it to express. So uh, you might think, whatever the artist had in mind, it's too late for that. Once you're watching the movie, you're kind of in charge of what it means to you. So you can, you're sort of, it's it's not like the movie is in charge of what's going on. It's certainly not like the artist is in charge. It's too late for them. So you might think, no, art can't lie to you. It can't deceive you because you're always sort of the one interpreting it in a certain way. But then you might think, well, no, art can lie to you because maybe the person who made it does have control over what the art says. It's not just all in your head, it's also part of what the artist had in mind, and so this is a debate about that. Classical Chinese philosophy, we'd be reading stuff from uh, Kongzi, Mozi, and Shunzi. So Kongzi is also known as Confucius, he's perhaps the most important classical Chinese uh, philosopher, so we'll see some of his thoughts. Shunzi is a Confucian, and uh, he's famous for developing uh, Confucius's thoughts and elaborating on human nature especially. And then uh, Mozi is from a rival school, the Moists, uh, he invented it, and they're sort of uh, rejecting Confucianism, which is mostly focused on uh, tradition and stability, and the Moists instead focus on sort of uh, universal happiness for everybody. And so we'll see debates between 
them and their thoughts on all sorts of topics, but mostly on how society should be structured and what sorts of people, or what sorts of, what human nature is like. For classical Islamic philosophy, we'd be reading uh, Ibn Rushd, The Incoherence of the Incoherence. So this is his response to a book, The Incoherence of Philosophy, or The Incoherence of the Philosophers. And uh, that book is arguing that basically philosophy, and specifically kind of classic Aristotelian philosophy of the sort that was uh, dominant in uh, the sort of golden age of Islamic philosophy, it, that's all junk. So that's what the incoherence of the philosophers was arguing. All of this Aristotelian philosophy is just, it, it, it doesn't make any sense, and we should reject it all, and instead uh, sort of turn to faith. Ibn Rushd is saying, uh, no, that's all wrong. Uh, Aristotelian philosophy is great, and it can be reconciled with Islam. So we can sort of have faith and philosophy, and they fit together just fine. So that's the sort of narrow project. And then it's about that, but really it's about sort of everything, because philosophy and uh, Islam sort of together encompass all the questions you might have about, like, how can we know things, and what should we believe, and things like that. Communism is we'd be reading Marx and Engels. So these are sort of introductions to what the kind of proposal is. Communism is a thesis about sort of how the world works, how the world is going to work, how society is structured, how society will be structured, perhaps should be structured. Uh, so we'll see sort of communist proposals for what the world ought to look like. And Marx was also a uh, journalist, and so we'll read a bit of his journalism reporting on uh, colonial, uh, British colonial India and uh, tying that in to his views on communism. COVID-19. So these are pretty straightforward if you read the title of the article. So an analysis of the ethics of lockdown in India, reopening economies during the COVID-19 pandemic, reasoning about value trade-offs, and how should we allocate health and social resources during a pandemic. So uh, how should we think about uh, the various ethical issues that face us in COVID, and specifically these three ethical issues, the lockdown, reopening, and allocating resources. Death. So this topic is mostly about whether and why death is bad. So there's this famous puzzle from uh, Epicurus, an ancient Greek philosopher. He said, death is not bad for you. Why? Well, uh, when you're alive, there is no death like it hasn't come yet so you don't have to worry about death while you're alive you're you're perfectly fine while you're alive and once you're dead you don't even exist anymore and if you don't exist anymore nothing can harm you so death can't harm you because it's only around when you're not around so death is harmless and so there's this debate about whether or not death is harmless and if death is harmful why is it harmful early modern european philosophy. So we'd read a couple essays by David Hume, a Scottish philosopher, The Standard of Taste, which is about, uh, are there sort of objective standards of taste? Is there sort of objectively better music, objectively worse music, objectively better books, objectively worse books? Or is it just, you know, everybody can like whatever they like and nobody's right or wrong about this? And then uh, talking about the ethics of suicide. And then we'd read Descartes' Meditations, which is a famous uh, philosophical work about uh, what we can know and how we can come to know it. So uh, <laughs> uh, the foundations of all of knowledge, and then uh, some responses to Descartes from uh, Princess Elizabeth of Bohemia. Eating animals is about the ethics of eating non-human animals. So uh, arguments back and forth about, is it wrong? to not be a vegetarian, and if so, why? And if not, why not? Existentialism is a philosophical movement focused on uh, sort of human freedom and uh, well, the implications of human freedom. And so we'd read, um, uh, we'd read Sartre and uh, Simone de Beauvoir. They both got thoughts about uh, what existentialism looks like. So we'd read some introductions to uh, how the existentialists think we should approach life, given the fact that we are free. Uh, speaking of freedom, free will is the question, are we free? And if so, how and why? Uh, one of the main challenges to free will is determinism. So the thought is, 
look, everything in the universe obeys the laws of physics. That includes you and your brain and all this stuff that's determining what you do. And that's kind of all like outside your control. So the laws of physics existed before you were even born. All the particles in your body are just obeying the laws of physics and they were predetermined to do this from the very beginning. So how can you have free will? So that's what a lot of the debate is about. Uh, and so we'll read debates about whether we have free will or not. Gender, you'll get a bit more information because one of the introductory articles is about this, but basically the question is, what is gender? So there are, is like, I'm a man, what does it mean to say I'm a man? Uh, as the first article puts it, what are the metaphysics of gender? Is it socially constructed? Is it uh, biological? Is it something else, etc.? Hellenistic Greek philosophy, uh, this is we'd read some of Epicurus. So he's the guy who introduced that puzzle about death I talked about earlier, uh, talking about how we should live as Epicureans, which is the philosophy that he invented. And they're focused on sort of uh, living a peaceful, pleasant life and sort of why we should do this and how we should go about doing this. What sorts of things should we focus on? We'll read some of the Stoics. The Stoics uh, were focused on a different sort of way of living life and uh, sort of following uh, the plan that the universe has for you and getting yourself reconciled with what the universe has planned for you. So accepting the things that you're unable to change and, uh, you know, feeling ready to change the things that you are able to change. And then we'll read some of the skeptics who thought that it's sort of impossible to know anything. And so we'll read their articles or their arguments for why we can't know anything. So for Indian and Buddhist philosophy, uh, like uh, the Islamic philosophy above, it's pretty like these, the Buddhist philosophy and the Indian philosophy we'll be reading are very wide ranging. So uh, they cover all sorts of topics. A lot of it is about epistemology, so a lot of it is similar to uh, the Descartes, which is, or the skeptics, which is, uh, what can we know? How can we know it? Uh, what are, like, how do we come by knowledge? Some of it is also about human nature and specifically whether the self exists. So there's this debate between the Buddhists and most of the other philosophers at the time about whether there is such a thing as the self and does the self exist? And the Buddhists say no, and everybody else says yes. Uh, multiculturalism and sexism. So multiculturalism is the thought that the government or government should accommodate various cultures. And uh, so we should have laws that allow for people from various cultures to practice their cultures and uh, that support various cultures. And you might think, well, great, that sounds good. Uh, but then the worry is that uh, if you sort of allow people to practice their cultures and give government support for practicing cultures, a lot of cultures are very traditionally sexist or otherwise objectionable. And so the worry is we have this clash between multiculturalism, which seems like a good thing, but then fighting against the oppression of women and fighting against oppression generally, and that seems good too. So how should we balance these things? And is multiculturalism, is endorsement of multiculturalism going to sort of set back uh, fights against sexism? Personal identity. So uh, above, I mentioned the debate between the Buddhists and basically everybody else in uh, classic Indian philosophy about whether the self exists. And personal identity is the question of like, what is the self? So assuming it exists, or even not assuming it exists, but like if it exists, what is it? Like, what is yourself? Uh, one way to dramatize the situation is to think of the, um, the, the transporters from the Star Trek TV show. You step into it and it sort of goes blah, 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 and then you disappear and then it rematerializes you somewhere else. And some people look at that and they say, great. Other people look at that and they say, wait, when it sort of disappears me at first, that that kills me. I'm dead. And then when it recreates somebody at the other end, that's just a that's a clone of me. That's not me. That's not me at the other end. So the debate about personal identity is about that sort of thing. So who who are you? Or like, is a clone of you the same as you? Or is it just very similar to you and stuff like that? Patriotism and nationalism. So the debate here is a lot of people take it to be 
uh, sort of obvious that you should be to some extent patriotic or to some extent nationalistic. And what does this mean? Well, uh, you should sort of look out for your fellow citizens. Uh, your government should look out for your fellow citizens more perhaps than you look out for other people. So who do you pay taxes to? The Indian government. What does the Indian government spend taxes on? Well, mostly India. And that makes perfect sense. All the other governments, people who live there, pay taxes to those governments, and those governments spend money on the people who live there. And so the thought is you should sort of prioritize your fellow citizens over, you know, anybody else in the world when it comes to who you have duties towards. Similarly to how you should prioritize your family, right? So who do you help out when they're in trouble? Probably your family and your friends more than strangers. And so the thought is, look, just like you should give priority to your family over strangers and give priority to your friends over strangers, you should give priority to your fellow citizens over strangers. And so this is the debate about should you do that and why or why not and things like that. Um, Okay, I didn't plan this out very well. How can I make this scroll down? Uh, this is going to take a moment. Okay, here we go. Sorry about that. Uh, next, terrorism. No, scientific realism. So. Uh, scientific realism is the debate about uh, science tells us all sorts of stuff exists that says like electrons exist and quarks exist and quantum whatever's exist, uh, DNA exists, but nobody's ever seen any of these things uh, in person. They're too small. <laughs> so uh, the question is, do these things exist or not? And the scientific realists say, yes, of course, whatever science tells you exists, exists. And the Scientific anti-realists say, mm, I don't know about that. And you might think, why? W <laughs> Clearly the scientific realists are right. Like, why would I ever disbelieve scientists? But um, there turn out to be arguments back and forth. Uh, here is just one very, very easy argument. If you go back 100 years, the scientists were saying very different things existed. If you go back 200 years, they were saying very, very different things existed. If you go back 300 years, they had very strange ideas about what existed. So you might think, well, science has gotten it wrong. 99% of the time, so I would have been wrong if 300 years ago I thought scientists were correct, so why should I think they're right now? So that's one sort of argument, but there are others. Terrorism is the question of what makes terrorism wrong, if it's wrong, when it's wrong, probably sometimes it's wrong. So when it's wrong, what makes it wrong? Is it always wrong, or could terrorism ever be justified? What is terrorism even in the first place? So what makes something terrorism as opposed to not terrorism? Uh, the annihilation of caste. So what should we do about caste? Uh, pretty straightforward. This, there's more to say here because I, I think unlike almost everything above, um, you may have read the debate between Ambedkar and Gandhi already. And so you may think, well, I don't, I don't need to read this again. I've already done it. But no, no, no. In philosophy, uh, you should always be very, very happy to reread things many, many times. All of these texts, um, especially all these classical texts, so like this stuff and then uh, this stuff and, um, you know, uh, any truly classic text, you can always get new things by reading it and rereading it and then discussing it with people and thinking about it and writing about it. So uh, don't reject this topic merely if you've read this in maybe a CTS course or earlier in your life. Uh, there's always more to say about it, and then you probably haven't read this. And then the riddles of induction. So this is two separate questions. One is from Hume, David Hume, uh, from his inquiry concerning human understanding. So the thought is basically everything but especially science relies on the idea that the future is going to be similar to the past. So uh, the law of gravity yesterday was things accelerate towards the surface of the earth, uh, towards the earth around the surface at 9.8 meters per second squared. In effect, gravity operates all around the universe at the same sort of way. And everybody just assumes that the laws of gravity yesterday are the same laws of gravity today, and they're gonna be the same tomorrow. 
and we think that about really everything like everything all the laws of nature are unchanging in this way and hume his question is sort of like why like what justifies you in believing this why couldn't the laws of gravity change tomorrow what would stop them so all the evidence we have is that the laws of gravity are unchanging so far but we don't have any evidence about what they're going to do tomorrow no scientist have, has ever studied tomorrow because it's not tomorrow yet nobody has a time machine so if you don't have a time machine how can you prove that the laws of gravity aren't going to change so that's hume's question that's the riddle of induction and then uh this guy named oops, this guy named nelson goodman uh has what he calls the new riddle of induction which is harder to explain in a straightforward manner but it's similar to hume's question and it's a question about how science can sort of prove uh scientific laws that it comes up with uh given that it doesn't seem to have evidence that can uh, support these things so uh these are the topics that i have so far if you have other possible topics that you'd like to vote on please let me know sooner rather than later and maybe i can add them in to uh the list and like i said at the outset of the video if you have more questions you can also always uh, ask me about any of these or all of these